Well, I must say I'm pretty excited today. It is 36 years, almost to the day, that Victoria was the first state in the world to legally recognise brothels. And today, will be, we will lead the nation in decriminalising sex work in Victoria. It's a year to the, to the day since I um, presented my report to the government about sex work decriminalisation. Um, in that time, I have spoken to ministers across the government. So this is planning, this is health, this is work cover, um, this is consumer affairs, this is equality. So I'm very hopeful that we are going to see an incredibly good piece of legislation that recognises the human rights of sex workers and recognises that sex work is just that work. This is sorry, stigma is front and centre of this legislation. We know that those laws that have been in place have harmed women. They have put sex workers at risk, not only of violence, but definitely of stigma and discrimination. This legislation, I'm hopeful, will put in an attribute into our Human Rights Charter to say that it is not okay to discriminate against someone on the grounds of their employment and on the grounds of them being a sex worker. Who's sex workers are you know, it's very hard to say how many sex workers there are in Victoria because the industry has been split. It works in kind of a grey area, but we would say probably over 10,000. You said this will make Victoria nationally in the area, but we are actually catching up online with other states in terms of sex work, so I guess how does this look like? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, absolutely. We, we were leaders 36 years ago, and then other states adopted better legislation. We saw better ideas. We saw better approaches to regulating this industry. And Victoria has now learned from that, and I think is taking, moving the bar further for other states to catch up to Victoria. And can you quote what exactly, um, what changes have we made that I think certainly recognising that stigma and discrimination um, exponentially affect sex workers. So by adopting discrimination legislation is certainly one area. By really focusing on work cover as the main, um, I guess the main department that should be looking at sex work, not the police, not the Attorney Generals, not even local government, but actually that this is about a workplace legislation. Yeah, talking about sex work is not easy. Um, and particularly in politics, it's not easy. So it has been hard to get sex work law reform on the agenda. And you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of, of heroes and giants who've been campaigning pretty much since the 1980s for better law reform, for better access to services, for less discrimination of sex workers. And so, yes, it is difficult. Sex is difficult in politics. Is it difficult for you to bring For me, it wasn't difficult. You know, I have a history of being a sex worker, I have a history of representing and campaigning for sex work law reform. So for me, this type of conversation rolls easily. But it's not so easy for other people. Other people feel that they'll be judged for talking about sex work. Other people feel uncomfortable about the issue. We, we'll, I, I expect that we will see a gradual change. So hopefully in this bill today, we will see um, decriminalisation, we will see um, discrimination legislation, uh, and we will see the beginning of the dismantling of the um, licensing scheme that has created two tiers in our industry. We have legal, we have legal brothels, and then we have a whole bunch of people working outside the law. And we got...
extensions that we can provide? I'm pretty confident that we will have support. Look, I would love to see bipartisan support on this. Uh, I, I believe that there was bipartisan support back in the 1980s. So I would hope that all sides of politics can see that a regulated industry is far better for the community and most importantly is far better for sex workers. You know, I actually am feeling a lot better for it. I mean, um, you know, all of you know, all of you have been attacked on social media. I know, I've seen it. Um, and, and I'm looking for ways to have other conversations with people. You know, we've, we've been sending out newsletters that have been getting really great open rates. So I think I can have respectful conversations with my community um, without having to get the pylons by trolls, without having to deal with those sock puppet puppets that just pop up and are vile and aggressive, not only to me, but to people who are being part of that conversation. We'll be back on social media, but I think um, maybe with a different approach. Is it something you feel you would have to get back on for the 20 now and that solution? Is it kind of a necessary? Um, who knows, actually? I must say I am enjoying um, having conversations with people not via one, 140 character text, text, text messages. But yes, you know, social media is part of our lives and it's certainly part of a politician's life. So we will come back. But how are we doing it? And I, I hope that we start the conversation about how we do deal uh, with really abusive and aggressive behaviour. You know, I, took, I you know, had a prosecution of a guy who's been given a jail sentence for three months for some of the stuff that's going on. So I hope that sends a message. But it's not acceptable. And that is anonymity on, on social media. That Last might help too. The Prime Minister was saying maybe we should have points of ID to open the place on the computer and then it's like something. I think this is becoming more and more important when we're starting to see uh, media agencies being the publishers on Facebook, being um, liable to, for comments made by anonymous posters. This probably means that we do need to change how we do this. We may need to strengthen our defamation legislation. We may need to strengthen our vilification legislation. And I've certainly been putting up legislation to do just that. But yes, anonymity on some of these platforms may need to be reconsidered. So, sorry, so another point of legislation, state of emergency, um, the new public health laws that they're working yeah. on. We've, um, we've certainly been consulted on this, uh, and I have certainly been speaking to groups like Liberty Victoria, like the Centre for Public Integrity. So we have absolutely said that any legislation that needs to be accountable, it needs to be transparent, and I think we're hearing murmurings that that will be the case. We're seeing that you know the minister will be responsible, not a public servant. And I think those types of changes hopefully will give the community confidence in the information that is will be made, made available under new legislation. Is that aspect landed in terms of the Minister being responsible? I, I have no idea. Um, as is much as I try and sneak into the Cabinet you? Office, but they keep kicking me out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Is that something you were pushing for? Uh, look, I, I've been looking, I've certainly been looking at other models. I've been looking at, at how Denmark you know, managed to come through this pandemic um, with, with lockdowns, with vaccine mandates, with all of that, but with community confidence. And that was done through being very open and transparent. And I, you know, certainly that had ministerial oversight. Uh, we see in New Zealand the same, the same approach um, with ministerial oversight. And I, um, I think we can learn from those jurisdictions.